tampon in high school boys bathroom destroyed less than 20 minutes after installation. Principal called it an egregious instance of vandalism and destruction of property. Valana said students shouldn't resort to vandalism when they don't understand something. Quote, ask for more information. Use your words to start a dialogue rather than using your hands to destroy my precious tampon dispenser in the boys' bathroom. Well, welcome to the Sean Bowl Show. And on today's show, we're going to be talking about some very serious issues. And the first one, we're going to talk about what's going on in New York City. New York City is imploding right now in so many different fronts. It's scary because in New York, we all grew up with and fell in love with through movies and through visiting. It's just not there anymore. There's not the same city. And there's so many woke politics and so many wrong agendas, as well as the immigration issues that our president has put in place to where New York is not safe. It's not a great place to be in right now because of the inflation. And there's even some boycotts and protests. We're going to talk all about that and we'll get there in just a minute. But before we get there, we also have a story coming up today about the gender war and how there's a gender war against your children. And there's some fascinating stories that have come out in the news over the last two months that are so terrifying for how government is trying to take control from parents in different states right here in America, also in Canada, and there's several other countries that are facing the same dynamics. We're gonna talk about this, and you're gonna know how to position your faith and your heart in the midst of that. Then I have a prophetic word. It's all about being prepared, and I'm gonna give you a perspective about why it's time to prepare, even with your resources, with your spirituality, but also, stocking up and actually prepping a little bit, homesteading a little bit because of some of the things that are about to come. God has shown me some of the things that we are in danger of facing in our generation and you don't want to be unprepared for these things. So make sure to tune in for the full word on Sunday or part of the word that you'll get at least a taste today. Well, we have this and more on today's show. Before we get there, we have Nutramedics, which is our sponsor. I want to encourage you to go visit Nutramedics, who has nutraceuticals for everything from hormones to sleep to every kind of supplement you can imagine. And they have a 20% off code for Bowles audience. So just enter my name, Bowles, in your uh, code at the very end of your checkout. I want to encourage you, this supports both our show, but it also helps you on your journey. And Nutramedics is such a phenomenal company who's given millions, tens of millions of dollars to the spreading of the gospel but they also have some of the best products in the world. They're not just a small company. They've been around for over 40 years. You can trust this company with your health. I'm gonna encourage you to go after it today. Nutramedics, the code is right here, Bowls for 20% off. And with that, we're gonna start our show. New York, are you okay? <laughs> we're wondering. Oh my gosh, there's so much going on politically in New York right now. I mean, there was a bill that was trying to be passed to take out the Statue of Liberty. There's been more immigrants that are illegal and undocumented than ever in history in one place in New York City and the surrounding cities. There's been the truck driver ban and boycott. There's been people in government coming against billionaires like Trump from doing business there and proclaiming and they call it lawfare. That's what it's being called. And we're going to talk about this and break this down. But New York, we're praying for you. New York's one of my favorite cities in the world, but I wouldn't go there right now with my children because it's so unsafe. And the culture is so anti what I believe in for conservative traditional American values, that it's not a place that you'd want to visit or bring your family to to support what's currently happening in a very woke political agenda all the way across the board, everything from the 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 gender issues, to the the racial issues, to the immigration issues, to the guns issues, to everything that a conservative American would believe in, New York is manifesting the opposite and imploding right now. Well, we saw a story this just in the last week and a half break out with Mayor Eric Adams, who's a self-proclaimed believer, but he has been responding, constantly putting out fires because there's so many things happening right now. And all he's doing is trying to build a negative reputation to a positive reputation and putting out fires from all the different agencies that are going rogue. Well, one of those rogue agencies was trying to make a prominent building that had built, been built 10 years ago to create affordable housing. That's a beautiful building in a part of Harlem that already has too many homeless shelters. 
and the city was going to make it into a, an immigrant shelter. So an illegal, undocumented immigrant shelter. And we already know that there's been so many deaths, that so many of these illegals who came in with criminal activity from Mexico have killed police officers, have wounded people. And so much of it isn't even on the news anymore because they're, they've been given orders on mainstream media not to show these stories. So you have to find them on Twitter. You have to find it, or X, formerly Twitter. You have to find them in places that share real news because there's so many undocumented aliens that are killing and hurt, harming and hurting our citizens right now. And so you have Eric Adams and Mayor Eric is actually responding to to a group of people in a video we're going to show you and saying, well, it's not going to be that. It's, you know, no, I've I've taken the, anybody who said that they can make this for, you know, undocumented people and for immigrants. It's not going to be that at all. It's going to be a homeless shelter for families. And they're looking at it going, uh... A homeless shelter we already have three in the same neighborhood that are at maximum occupancy which means they need more but it's it's causing the whole neighborhood to have an increase of crime and for the morality to go down so let's watch this video no i don't agree with it it turned into a sanctuary for asylum seekers no when we have people right here that need the space right, come on while neighbors were gathering to share their concerns mayor eric adams dropped in to answer questions you are the mayor. We do not want to hear excuses. But the mayor announced a change of course. I told the team, find out what's going on here. We're not moving folks into a brand new building when you have long-term needs into a community. That's not going to happen. So this this makes him look like a hero. He's putting out a fire. But the reality is, is that the citizens there are still saying, like, why aren't we voting on this? Why isn't there not being a vote when we already have so much of a homeless epidemic and problem and we have shelters that aren't working enough? Why aren't we looking for new solutions? And this is actually causing the quality of life for all of us to go down. There's people who can't afford their rent. They're being they're being priced out of this neighborhood. Why can't they this be a, a house for lower income families? The luxury building will instead be a shelter for long term New York City families. You will not have migrants and asylum seekers in that property. Residents told me they're relieved for the change, but frustrated by the city's lack of transparency around opening a shelter in the first place. Many wish they had more input about the building's future. We have too many homeless shelters in this community. Regina Smith says she'd like to see it become affordable housing. There you go. percent of households in this neighborhood are rent burdened, meaning over a third of their income goes towards rent. We have a dearth of affordable housing. We're being priced out of the community. So there you have it right there. They're being priced out of the community. We have this issue going on in New York. And this is just one of the communities of New York. You have Queens. You have New York City proper, Manhattan. You have all these places, New Jersey, that are having the same kinds of problems. And they're exhausted. And there's no solutions for them. And the mayors of these different areas are not helping. They're, they're, they're just putting out fires. They're not adding solutions, which is so just so sad. I want to take some time sometime soon to show Joe Rogan and Dr. Phil because Dr. Phil is going after gender. He's taking his very mainstream secular platform and going after gender in a real way. And he's doing some specials on this on his new channel, Merritt Street Media. At the same time, I think that there's a discussion we can have today. There's some stories that have come out and the rights against parents are under attack. And also the, the fight against to indoctrinate your children is also there. And I don't want to sound like just you know, the guy who's on a bandwagon, because I've never even, until this year or last year, I never even realized how deep the fight was. I have another video from Libs of TikTok that goes along the same vein. I know Libs of TikTok is so controversial, but this particular interview speaks for itself. I found out about this when my son was about five years old. Uh, he was in kindergarten. Uh, some time went by and I got a letter in the mail and it was his report card and it was addressed to the parent or guardian of Ruby Rose Hannon. Now, I didn't recognize the name Ruby Rose. That is not my son's name. I thought that maybe they had the wrong child on the letterhead, but the address was correct. So I opened it up and that was probably one of the worst days in my life. I realized that my son was assigned a female name, Ruby Rose. I had never heard this name before. Um, and they referred to my son exclusively using female pronouns, she, her. It wasn't that they were notifying me that he had gender dysphoria. It was already after the fact. They had already socially transitioned my son without my knowledge or consent. What? Again, this child at school was socially transitioned. I mean, how confusing is this? And obviously he was told 
to protect his, you know, this is new identity from his parents because his dad didn't know. By, by socially transition, um, you mean like your son is wearing dresses to school? Yes, uh, hair done up, makeup, um, female clothing, accessories, every accoutrement you can think of. You would have thought that he was a little girl. I would only have him for two hours uh, Tuesday and two hours Thursday. And But when I was picking him up, when he was in my care, he was a boy. He was a boy named Matthew. But when he was in his mother's care and when he was going to school, he was a girl named Ruby. Looking back too, it just tells me how much they normalized this for him because he never gave any indication that his name was different at his mother's house. We discovered that at about age two to three, he was going to a therapist by the name of uh, Andrea Binner. And Andrea Binner is in Buffalo, and she is self she's a self-proclaimed uh, transgender therapist that specializes in adolescence, and she does gender-affirming therapy. So this little child is going to a transgender therapist. Now, Andrea Binner never kept any notes at all on any therapy sessions that she had with my child. It came out that she not only did she not follow the death standards for transgender care, but my son never and still hasn't had any formal diagnosis of gender dysphoria using the DSM-5 criteria. And the fact that this man, Dennis, had to know all these things, because I don't know, like DS-5 criteria, I don't know these things. But the fact that he had to learn and learn what this is, gender dysphoria is, and learn with his child, because the mom and the dad obviously are not together, and there's something happening in the household that's not happening in his household. But the fact that he then gets in trouble for his participation. Now, what Binner did afterwards was at about four years old, she referred my son to a endocrinologist at the University of Rochester Pediatric Division by the name of Dr. Tran. I am not making that up. I know. I know. It's, Wait, say that again. If you don't laugh, you cry. Dr. Tran had two phone calls totaling 45 minutes with the mother only. They never spoke to my child. They never met my child. Yet over those two 45-minute phone calls, they came to this conclusion that my son has gender dysphoria and they recommended the potential for puberty blockers around the age nine. And this is when your child is four. Yeah. I mean, four years old, four years old. And why? There's financial motivation, but there's also a, a totally insidious agenda behind this on why doctors who've never talked to a child would take on, I mean, a counselor doesn't even keep notes, then the doctor is giving puberty blockers at the age of nine without meeting a child. That should be incriminating. I mean, that, that doctor should be going to jail. The good news is that Dennis now his son's older and Dennis, his son is now a son. He's like, he looks back and goes, what was happening? Like, why did they do this to me? And so he realizes he's a victim of the system. And Dennis now has his son spend time with him again, which I think is so important. And one last story on this. Tampon dispenser installed in high school boys' bathroom destroyed less than 20 minutes after installation. So you have to realize Generation Z is not buying into all of this nonsense when it comes to high schoolers and below right now. Can you imagine you're a boy, a teenage boy, and you walk into your bathroom where you go to the bathroom? It's private. I mean, it's like you don't want girls in there like looking at you. And there's a tampon dispenser and you're going, what? Like, why is there a tampon dispenser? Well, there's a whole crowd out there that says, well, men can menstruate and women, you know, can whatever. You know, it's just like it's so bizarre. This whole thing is so weird. But with uh, Jeremy and the quartering, he showed the picture and this is. This is the picture. It hasn't even been one period. Principal called it an egregious instance of vandalism and destruction of property. So the principal was mad at the students and was trying to figure out the students to penalize them because they took down his tampon dispenser and for boys, tampon dispenser for boys. And this is showing that people are revolting and we need to revolt and we need to bring these stories into the light. So here's part of an email sent the same day to the school staff and students from their woke insane principal see if you can figure out where this guy's coming from titled i'm feeling dis dash right now and saying that he was disgusted and dismayed by the behavior a dispenser with menstrual products was installed in the boys bathroom near the main office Bolando said in the email quote the installation was completed at 9 30 a.m by 9 52 a.m 
Tampons were on the floor. The newly installed distribution box was ripped off the wall along with the masonry anchors and the distribution box itself was a stroll. I'll just say all this, which is ask for more information. He says, use your words to start a dialogue rather than your hands to destroy something. In this particular instance, if you have questions, please let me know. I mean, you're a high school principal and you should know that the majority of people don't believe in this gender ideology. The majority of people in America are not on this woke train. And this is what's the problem is that we're watching people who are saying, you know, this is how it should be, who are in leadership roles and people are revolting against them. And then they're criminalizing and yelling, you're wrong and we're gonna penalize you for it versus them actually having a discussion to say, let me reevaluate when half of America doesn't believe like I do. And a third of America on top of that, on top of that half is confused and only maybe one third or less, which I believe it's even less than one third, believe in this. Maybe the conversation has to be slower than installing a tampon dispenser in the bathroom. And that's what's important is that we look at this through rational eyes and there's, there's no rationality when it comes to these extremely left progressive individuals who are trying to create this atmosphere. Well, I do wanna remind you that the war on children by Cuban American Robbie Starbuck is out right now. Watch it, tell me what you think about it. Let's have a conversation about all of this below. If you've been violated by these kinds of policies or, or politics, I wanna hear about that too. We're gonna to be praying for you. And we believe that God had made male and female and that he's gonna defend it himself. The beautiful thing is we don't even have to defend it as much as God will. I and mean, we should do whatever we can do in our power. But God is gonna bring, just like when there was a sexual revolution in about, 90% of it was so demonic and insidious and the epidemic of AIDS and all these things came out of that because of just the sin was so great. People reaped in such a terrible way what they were sowing. And we watched popular psychology leading that movement. And then it, there was a pendulum swing back to traditional conservative values. We're going to watch that again over some of these issues where this is going to be looked at just like we look at what happened in the sexual revolution as insidious, as gross, as not, as not healthy. We're, people are going to look back at this. It's like cigarette smoke. It's like people who, you know, like you see on the box of cigarettes, you see the teeth that are all rotten out, and they have to they have to pay for it as a cigarette company to be on there because the Surgeon General warning has to be posted that you will probably die if you smoke cigarettes long term. We're going to watch people who are in charge of these surgeries now who are making their money and are getting all kinds of esteem and power and these soccer moms who have a trans kid who think it's so cool and it's the new status symbol. We're going to watch this change. I don't know how long it's going to take, but it's going to change. This will not be the forever reality everywhere over America. And this may cause a moral revolution and also a moral civil war. And there might be pockets where some believe one way and some believe the other. But we're going to watch even Christianity will come into play to help this. I want to hear what you think. Let's talk about it below. I have a prophetic word for you, and it's all about being prepared. And this is really an interesting topic for me because I've started the video telling you that I'm probably the least likely person to talk about prepping and homesteading and thinking about potential war type activity that might break out you know, domestically or even in foreign lands that could affect us personally. But I've been hearing God about this for of the past season. I felt I needed to share this. And I heard God say last year, I think probably three different times, be ready and be prepared. And some of that caused me to do more estate planning, some of that caused me to do more, you know, just thinking about being prepared for ministry and what we're doing here in Texas now and also in California. And part of me was like, wait, that wasn't it though. Like when you prepare and you do some things and you go, I didn't, I checked those boxes, but there's still boxes to be checked type thing. So when I heard be ready and pre be prepared back again in October of 2023, it came with a knowing that time. And I think I knew it all along, but I was in denial of part of it because you don't want to think that there's going to be instability in governments and there's going to be food shortages and there's going to be natural disasters and even terrorist threats. You don't want to think about those things. A lot of us want to close our eyes to it. But when I opened my eyes and just said, God, show me with your faith eyes and your love eyes, you love humanity, you love this world, show me what I'm supposed to look at. And I was able to like regroup myself from maybe growing up in a Pentecostal charismatic background where people did a lot of weird things to prepare and they said, this will happen on this date and so you better have this much food or this much, and you may not have been exposed to that, but that's a very real thing in Christians. There's some people who, have been led by kind of a false prophetic narrative or journey that's caused a fear reaction to separate from culture and society and not to be uh, somebody who would love your neighbor still. And so I think in the midst of us thinking about being prepared, part of the beautiful thing is if we get prepared, we can love well because we're not at the same deficit. If a natural disaster hits your city and you have supplies and you have, you know, you prepared yourself, 
then you actually have the ability to love your neighborhood and your and your community well. And if you haven't prepared yourself, if you're not listening to God, if you're in denial or you get into a state of maybe unbelief or disbelief or offense at preparedness or people who are preppers, then you actually may not have the effectiveness of sharing the love of God because you don't have, I mean, love looks like something. You don't have the resources to share. So we need to be prepared. And there's even a special grace. And I think an anointing right now over regions and over industries, over places, over people groups, and even over your family to prepare. And I want to give you some prophetic perspective, but also some just basic grounds for spiritual preparedness and natural preparedness, just ways to think about it scripturally. Because one of the things I love is that, you know, when you're thinking about spiritual preparedness, the number one way we stay spiritually prepared is we stay rooted in the word. I mean, it's the lamp into our feet, Psalm 119 verse 105. I mean, it's, it's the thing in times of uncertainty that the Bible gives an unfailing guide. It always illuminates ways that are, that, that are ways forward that provide you a way of hope and strength and peace when there is no peace to be had in the cir- circumstances and situations around you. And I love that. I love that the word is such a guiding light and gives you times. I mean, two of the biggest times of prophecy in the Bible, you have the the season of Joseph, where Joseph was able to prepare Egypt and also Israel for a famine that was coming. He had a prophetic word that a famine was coming. This is There's biblical prototypes for being prepared. Then you also have one of the first prophetic words in the whole church in the book of Acts was Agabus, who said a famine's coming. It's going to last multiple years. And he helped the early believers prepare not only for themselves, but for all the other believers and even other people, other communities. And I think that's really important important that we see that there is times, there's biblical presence, both in Old and New Testament, where we start to read and we go, okay, God, maybe you're telling me to be prepared. And so give me a strategy like you gave Joseph or Agabus and the early believers, and God will give you a strategy. But when you read the Bible, it helps you to be comforted by his plan in the midst of the world's suffering. The world is going to keep suffering, and there's going to be increasing of suffering in certain areas. But that doesn't mean that you have to suffer at the same capacity or be traumatized in the same way. And we can learn how to prepare by reading the word. But also, of course, we know prayer is the second thing. And I know we all know that. I mean, this is almost like um, Sunday School 101. But when you when you pray, you really thank God for all that he has in the midst of circumstances that are really hard. And you really look for God's will in prayer. You know, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 really talks about this. This is God's will for you, that you you pray and you look for him in circumstances and that you thank him in the, in, with an attitude of, of gratitude in that sense. And we have to cultivate that in prayer and seek his wisdom and protection over our life and our land and our loved ones. We really want to do that. And the third major one in spiritual preparedness is you need to foster community. Now, when I say this, it's not just having a community at school. It's not just having a great prayer group at church, but you really want to consider how the people that are in your life, that they're also on track spiritually with you to be there, that they're your ride or dies. They're going to be there with you if there's a disaster, if there's a sickness, if there's another pandemic. Maybe you learned that during the last pandemic, you didn't have the right community. You didn't have the right people. You didn't have ride or dies. You had people who were great when you did functional things together, but they weren't there. They were afraid to get together. They were afraid to come over. They were afraid to expose themselves. And so there was no sharing, bartering, connecting, those kinds of things. And so we need to look at Hebrews 10, 24, where it says, don't give up meeting, love one another, do good deeds, encourage each other, spur each other on. If you have people who didn't spur you on in coronavirus times, then ask God, who are my people? Who are my community? We want to have in these challenging times, real Christian community that becomes a source of strength and that we can be a strength to an encouragement and have practical support. And there's a lot of you that lost your practical support network. Well, if you lost it, that means God wants to rebuild it. He wants you to be intentional about that. And that's part of being prepared and saying, and this might be the biggest one for some of you, maybe reading the Bible and praying is, that's that's the easy stuff, but actually developing a spiritual community that actually sacrifices for each other and actually spurs each other on is something that maybe you're going to have to find and actually be really deliberate through. You know, when it comes to natural preparedness, I think a lot of us get afraid because we feel so overwhelmed by what we're already doing in life. But like I'm telling you, there's an anointing on this. So if there's an anointing on it and the Bible also helps us in this, I'm going to encourage you to ask God, what are some steps I can take today towards preparedness? And the first thing I want to talk about is being a wise steward of your life. And Proverbs 21, 20, I love the scripture. It says, the wise store up choice food in olive oil, but fools gulp down all of their food in olive oil. They, fall, they just gulp it down. Well, wisdom really helps us to have 
an understanding of prudence and preparedness and ensures us to really have the necessary supplies and resources in time of need. So part of having true biblical wisdom is actually having preparedness. The second thing is I want to encourage you to learn and, and then educate others as you're learning. And I love that with my wife. She's been learning about homesteading and growing food for a while now. And she's just, she just opened her Instagram and TikTok up to this and ended up, you know, thousands of people end up watching it. And again, she's been taking about a year break right now, but she's about to get back on. And in this season of, of everyone watching it, she was so surprised that we would give friends like zucchinis or gourds or whatever. We'd give them food, you know, acorn squashes for them to eat that we'd grown our garden because she's growing food for 18 people, you know, 20 people. And so we give them food out of our garden and our good friends, these are great people would say, I don't know how to cook a zucchini. I don't know what to do with an eggplant. Like I've never cooked an eggplant before. All of our friends who we gave food to, we'd have to give recipes to, we'd have to give them an understanding of something easy you can do with living food. We had one friend that we tried to get food to from the garden and he said, I don't wanna know where my food comes from, it grosses me out, because the dirt and the worms, the compost and all that stuff made him feel sick inside. And so that shows the detachment from something that should be right in the center of our universe as Christians. We shouldn't have detachment from tending the, the garden or tending the land, it's part of our calling. It doesn't mean everybody has to grow food, but everybody should grow food or could grow food. And I think that's important. Well, I love Proverbs 1, 5. It says, a wise man will hear and increase in learning and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. And I've watched that with my wife specifically. She's led us on a journey when it comes to natural preparedness. And she's learning about, you know, what happens if you don't have a well. And we happen to have a well. But if you don't have a well, how can you prepare with rainwater to water your garden? Because if your electricity goes out and you don't have pressure for your hoses, how do you water things? And so learning something like that or learning something about solar power device on your well so that it still can pressurize if you have a well. And all these little keys that she's learning as she goes along and she's getting wise counsel from people. And it's amazing when you're dealing with, and I'll just talk about the garden community or the farming community, they so want to resource each other. There's not a lot of competition. There's like, you care about food too? Here, let me tell you what works best for me in my zone. And I love that. And that's a very biblical mentality when there's something that we know is good for us, we can't help but share it. But I love Proverbs 31, 16. It says, she considers a field, she buys it, and out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. And I love that sense of self you know, reliance and self-dependency. That's the healthy kind, not the unhealthy pride ego, but it's the healthy kind to say, God's given me an ability to steward, to own, to develop, to tend, and to take care of my own. I want to hear from you. So say hashtag my turn. Tell us what you're doing. Tell us how we can pray for you. And even tell us if you feel overwhelmed. I want to hear that in the comments below because I know this can be overwhelming, but I'm telling you, we'll resource each other. We There's people out there who want to help you. There's people out there who are going to encourage you. And even if we just pray together, it's going to be a lot. So make sure to leave those comments too. Now it's time for news you need to know. Iris Ministries, a ministry that reaches out to war zones, conflict areas, and people at risk, is reporting villages, churches, and pastors in northern Mozambique are being targeted by ISIS al-Shabaab extremists and mass murders, burnings, and torture. Here's a video about that from director Heidi Baker, who's a, who's a spiritual friend of ours. I'm coming to you again from Cabo Delgado. I just feel like as the church around the world is praying for us as we've lost our pastors, many have been killed, many are missing. We've had now, from what I know, in the last 12 days, 14 of our churches, partners in Harvest Virus, churches have been burned to the ground. We fix our eyes on Jesus. We are not losing whose brothers and sisters are here. We're all free for our brothers and our sisters who have lost their family members. Look at this. This is the body of Christ. You are joining with the body of Christ. We're going to be praying with Heidi Baker and Iris Ministries. You can leave a donation to help them in their time of need at Iris Global, and I would encourage you to do just that. Well, according to a new Harris X poll, nearly 10,000 entertainment consumers across 11 countries that was covered in a Variety and NPR article had found that 69% of Americans and 63% of people around the world believe entertainment perpetuates religious stereotypes. These same people also ranked and polled faith themes as number six out of 18 themes they desire to see in movies and television. This actually shocked those who took the poll. Yet respondents share that when they see their religion of faith,
faith of others, including in mainstream entertainment, they feel it's often sensationalized or that it's portrayed through a lens of stereotypes. In another story, it was revealed earlier this month that 31 of the hostages held by Hamas have died, and Israel has confirmed this. According to CBN News, IDF spokesperson Daniel Hagari said that 31 hostages' families were informed by the military that their loved ones had passed away. Moreover, the New York Times reported that an additional 20 hostages were possibly killed based on unconfirmed information by Israeli intelligence. Some of the deaths either took place during Hamas' attack on Israel on October 7th, injuries during captivity, while others were killed by Hamas in Gaza. Our prayers are with the hostages still alive, their families, and with Israel. I'm going to encourage you to be praying with us because a lot of the reasons why the hostages died was so they couldn't share their stories in captivity because of brutality. Well, that brings us to the end of our show. I want to thank you so much for watching the Sean Bull Show. We do this every week so you can discern what God's doing in culture. Hey, I need to hear back from you too. So if you're watching this on a podcast server or if you're here on YouTube, I'm going to encourage you, leave a comment. Tell me what you liked about the show. Tell me areas we can grow in. We'd love to hear that. Leave a review for us at your favorite podcast server. And that helps us so much to be seen and heard by others out there. You have made us in the top 200 news commentary podcasts worldwide. And it's a faith-based show done by a very small team. I so appreciate you helping us to have a voice and a reach just like that. We'll see you next time.